Hi there, it's so good to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I've so enjoyed spending this last few days in, in, your, in the area, in your state. I've been, been here in, I've been in St. Louis. I've been meeting with pastors from all over. I've had a great time. I've enjoyed seeing the autumn, I would call them autumn colors and the leaves. And I've been really blessed by seeing friends and talking to pastors and just being back in America, which I love. So it's my first time in the state, actually, and I've really enjoyed being here. So thank you for having me. And if you've got a Bible, could you turn to Acts chapter 4? Acts chapter 4. During the Super Bowl last February, there was an advert that you may have seen during many of the breaks uh, featuring Bruce Springsteen. It was an advert for the Jeep, and the advert was called The Middle. I don't know if you, I presume many of our homes we would watch the Super Bowl. I live in England. We don't watch American football because we think football is a game to be played with feet. But nevertheless, I saw this ad. A lot of people did. It was, a, or commercial, you might call it. It was, a lot of people saw it and it was a, 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 sto- a sort of storytelling advert about the way that as a nation, we all need to meet in the middle. And it was shot in Lebanon, Kansas, which I guess is not that far from here, in American terms anyway, but it's the exact middle of the lower 48, the exact middle of America. So it was the idea, what we need is a nation that's divided needs to be able to come together and meet in the middle. I don't know why that would mean you need to go and buy a Jeep. I didn't quite make that connection in the advert, but it was the idea that as a nation, people are fragmented and divided, but we need to meet in the middle. What Bruce Springsteen might not have known is that if you weight America not by space, but by population, the exact middle of America is not in Kansas, it's Missouri. In fact, for the last 40 years, the weighted center of America by population, where the average person lives, has moved between various different counties in Missouri. But this is, people-wise, where we are right now, this is the middle of America. And while I was thinking about your city and your community and your state, I was thinking to myself, I, just, I felt God lead me to speak to you about being a church in the middle. A church that in, a, in divided times where there are extremes here and extremes there and there are things that often don't go together, speaking to you a bit from Acts chapter four about what it is to be a church in the middle, a church where things that don't often get brought together come together here in the church, in this church, in your community. Things that are often tragically divided and separate finding unity in the church. And I think Acts chapter four gives us some remarkable examples of how to do that. And the fascinating thing about the advert I mentioned, the Bruce Springsteen ad is the lack of a solution. So I was watching this ad and listening to the, it was well written, it was beautifully shot as as these Super Bowl ads always are. But the diagnosis of the problem was really good. We live in divided times, politically, racially, sexually, culturally, religiously, and we need to find a way somehow of meeting in the middle. And I think probably most of us would resonate and would say, yes, I can see why that's good. We need to do that. But the solution was completely ineffective. The solution was aging rock musician in the middle of nowhere, driving a Jeep on his own. And I was thinking, how does that bring people together? Like, I'm not sure that it does on its own at all. Hey, America, come together and buy an SUV and drive around in the middle of nowhere on your own. I'm not sure that that's quite the consensus building center that the advertisers perhaps think it is. Now, 21st century America is not the first society in history to be divided. It's, in some ways, it's an encouraging thing that as, it's, as to the extent that you are divided, you're aware of it and see it as a problem. And in many societies in history, they'd be very divided between rich and poor and people just wouldn't care. Uh, My last trip before this, uh, before COVID started, I was in India and I was meeting a lot of people who, you know, came talking to me about the legacy of British rule in India. British India was an incredibly divided society, but the British didn't care. They were just like, no, okay, well, we're ruling it and you guys aren't. What's the problem? In your culture, it's seen as a problem if there's division. And we want to meet, There's there's a desire to come together and meet in the middle. That's a good thing. But if you were to head into a bookshop near here, to read about the divisions in America, you would find plenty of people analyzing the problem very well, but with solutions that don't match up to the reality of the world or the scale of the need. How do you bring wildly different people together? Now, you can see this a mile away, but here it comes anyway. God's solution to that kind of division is the church. God's solution, God's way of bringing people together into the middle to meet and to build relationships and deep uh, structural integrity and love and care and grace for one another. God's idea to do that is through the church of Jesus Christ. 
God's response to the human tendency to divide into like-minded groups who are suspicious of each other, God's solution is the church of Jesus Christ, where people say, I will, I will, my allegiance to Jesus will overcome my allegiance to all of these other things, even my own tribe, and I will come here and I will meet you in the middle because we both serve a Lord who's bigger and greater than we are. The church is called to be a place where things that are separated normally get united in Christ. The church is called to be a place where we meet in the middle and so is your church. I want to read from Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly, in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. There wasn't a single needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as he had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of God. In theological terms, the way that you meet in the middle is not by compromising equally between two truths. It's to affirm two truths at the same time, even if, especially if, the result is mysterious. So an obvious example, Jesus is not half man, half God. If you want to meet in the middle, your theological convictions about Jesus, divinity, humanity, how does that work? What you don't do is say, oh, he's kind of half and half. The way you do it is by saying Jesus is fully man, and fully God. And those two truths meet in the middle in Him. So theology is more like a salad than a smoothie. Okay, so in a smoothie, you put lots of different fruits in and you mix them all up and stir it and whiz it. And then you give someone a drink and sometimes you might even have to guess. If you, you had this, someone gives you a smoothie and they say, guess what's in it? And you go, oh, it's, it's obviously a bit of strawberry or maybe a bit of banana, but well, anything else? And they say, yeah, there's a bit of guava, a bit of lemon juice or something. But you can't always tell what's in it because the, the individual fruits have been submerged into this sort of huge smoothie-like soup that doesn't really taste exactly like any of them. Whereas in a salad, what happens is all of the different elements preserve their unique identity and sit next to each other and enhance each other. So you want the crunchiness of the lettuce and the softness of the tomato and all the rest. And a salad, everything retains its own identity next to something else that is kind of different from it. And those things offset one another, but they retain their individual integrity. And theology is more like a salad than a smoothie. It's more like putting together two different things that meet in the middle, rather than just mushing things up, blending them and making a mixture of all of it that's half this, half that. And there's a great example of that right at the start of the passage we just read. Great example of how the church is called to be a place where people meet in the middle by being a both and community, right at the start. How do you, for instance, how do you combine urgent, desperate prayer and utter confidence in the sovereignty of God? Right? What, what people can do is at one end of the spectrum, they would have people who pray passionately, but think that ultimately God isn't sovereign over all things and certainly not all human decisions. 
And they're praying desperately because they're going, God, you've got to do something. But they don't think he's basically sovereign over all things, but they're calling on him to do something about this thing. On the other end of the spectrum, you might have people who think the exact opposite. They say, well, God is sovereign, so I don't really know why we'd need to pray because, you know, que sera, sera, whatever God would, you know, if God's got it in mind, I'm sure it'll happen. And so you get passive acceptance on this side and you have passionate prayer, but without a belief in God's sovereignty on the other side. But in this church, in the Acts 4 church, what happens is those two things meet in the middle. You have a group of people who, verse 24, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them, verse 29, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. They have a people whose confession is, we are going to pray to a sovereign God who is in charge of all things. And actually, as we'll see in a minute, the very plan to have Jesus crucified was your plan in the end. So you're in charge of all things. But we are now going to ask you desperately, would you step in to this situation right now and give us power and give us boldness to preach and to heal? Because if you don't have that, if we don't have that, we have nothing. And so what they do is they combine these two things, a high view of divine sovereignty and a high view of the urgency of prayer, and they bring them together and meet them in the middle. This church combines things that are often kept separate. This is one example. They don't think, if God's sovereign, why pray? They think, if God is not sovereign, why pray? Why would I pray to a God who isn't in charge of all things? You have to swallow a lot of mystery at that point, but that's Christianity, and that's what this church do. That's one example of how their both andness, their meeting in the middle, functions in this church. You get the same sort of thing a few verses later with the coming together, the meeting in the middle of the Word and the Spirit. All right, so verses 29 to 31, they pray, Now, Lord, look upon the threats of these people who are persecuting us and grant to your servants to continue to speak your Word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal with signs and wonders. And when they've prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continue to speak the word of God with all boldness, right? In, again, in, in your nation and mine, churches that are really strong on the word, churches that are really strong in pursuing the power of the Holy Spirit, often separated from each other, often, not always. But this church is a church where they meet in the middle, a church that is totally committed to the power of God to break out and mix the people of God and to heal people and work signs and wonders and speak prophetically and where they do all of that because they want to be equipped with boldness to speak the word because they want to share the gospel because they want to lift up Christ and have people respond to his words and obey him and have their life transformed by him. And so churches of the spirit and the word come together in Acts chapter four. In the Western world, for various historical reasons, those traditions have been separated somewhat in the last hundred or so years. And churches which are passionate about studying scripture are not always passionate about signs and wonders and vice versa. But in this church, in scripture, and in this church we're speaking to now, the, the pursuit of word and spirit, gospel-centered and spirit-empowered, they come together, they meet in the middle. This is part of, I know, this, I know this, is, this is easy, right? Because this is on your website. This is something that you want to be as a church. And, but it's just good to see it. It's in scripture. Now, these people, they prayed and they called on the God who is sovereign to give them signs and wonders and power in the spirit in order that they might speak the word with boldness because they wanted the word and the spirit to meet in the middle. And so do we. Uh, I say, I know that's part of your DNA because I've seen, you, I've seen your website and I know some of your leaders. So that's an easy start. But now let's, let's consider a slightly trickier example in the passage. Another example of two truths meeting in the middle. Right? The meeting in the middle of divine and human activity, what theologians call compatibilism, the idea that God's activity or agency and ours meet together in human decisions. I can see that in this text as well. I can see it in two ways. The first is in the writing of Scripture itself. They pray, Sovereign Lord, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why do the nations rage? Do you notice that in verse 25? God, who spoke through David by the Spirit. So who's doing the speaking? David or God? Both. God, who spoke through David by the Spirit. In other words, Scripture as the words of God to us, 
is, being, is spoken by both David and God at the same time. It's like saying, who said to be or not to be? That is the question. Shakespeare or Hamlet? They say both. Shakespeare by Hamlet said. Right? That's the way a lot of art works and that's the way the Bible works. The idea that you have both of these agents, God and us speaking at the same time. And we tend not, not to think like that. We tend to think, no, hang on. If God's doing it, I'm not doing it, like a seesaw. And if I'm doing it, God's not doing it. But the Bible doesn't think about the relationship between God's activity and ours like a seesaw. The Bible thinks of, I, I tend to prefer thinking about a saxophone rather than a seesaw. The idea that if you've got a great saxophonist, Miles Davis, someone like that, blows into the saxophone and the more breath he puts in, the more the saxophone has to do to bring the sound out. Or maybe you're blowing up a balloon. And the more air you put into the balloon, the more the latex of the balloon has to do. That God provides the breath to speak scripture into being, but human agents, human beings, then also have to do more, not less. And it's true in your life too. The more God wants to do in your life, the more work you have to do in response to him. Now, if you're doing nothing, God, God's not using you, you don't have to do very much. But none of us find that God does it all and we do nothing. And none of us find that we do it all and God does nothing. That's not the way the world is. It's not the way these people were. And you can see that in this text and you can see it in events as well. The same thing happens as even they're talking about the crucifixion of Jesus and they're praying, verse 26, the kings of the earth set themselves and rulers were gathered together, Pilate, Herod, and so on, to do whatever you had predestined to happen. In other words, they were doing stuff because you had planned it to happen. They were all plotting this. You had predestined that. And the two things again happen together. So who's responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus? Is it Pilate and Herod and the Romans and the Jews? Or is it God? The answer is yes. They meet in the middle. And because we know that God is in charge of all things, we can pray for God to do anything we ask. And because we know that God has ordained, He's agreed before the beginning of time to save a whole bunch of people, we can preach to those people the gospel and witness to what Jesus has done, confident of success. Acts 18 says the same thing later in this book. God appears to Paul and says, Paul, you've got to stay where you are, keep preaching, don't back down, because I've got lots of people in this city who are my people. So the idea of God's in charge and we've got a lot to do, meet in the middle. So... I'm using all of these as examples of how this church is a both and church. A church where precious truths meet in the middle and it's, it's prayer life, it's worshipping life, it's doctrine of scripture, it's evangelism, it's theology. This is a church where things that are often kept separate meet in the middle. And it's very easy for those things to get divided in our world. You have prayers over there, passionate prayers, and you have believers in providence over there. Oh, I trust God. It'll all be fine. Nothing to pray about here. It's all too easy to, you know, your reformed missionaries over there and your charismatic signs and wonders people over there. In Jerusalem, they meet in the middle. They reach for both and. They have their cake and eat it. It's like that title. There was a book about the vineyard movement written a few years back called The Quest for the Radical Middle, which is a great title. I love that idea. Oh, what your church is called to do, what we are called to do as believers, what the church in Jerusalem was, was a church that pursued the radical middle that said there are all sorts of areas, and we've just touched on a handful here, there are all sorts of areas where it's easy to drift that way or that way, and we need them to come together and pursue them both at the same time. I love that. But in our generation, the hardest one is probably this last one we're going to look at, which is how to pursue unity and diversity together. All right, that just isn't something you can affirm theologically. The church is one and the church is diverse. Okay, I get that. But this is actually something that you have to work out practically in a culture that is, like much of the Western world, like where I live too, is quite divided at the moment in our generation. And considering its context, the church in Jerusalem is actually very diverse. You might think, well, this is just a Jewish church. And of course, religiously it is, but the church is very diverse. There are people who are so needy that they can't feed themselves without the church. And we just read, there are people so rich that they've got lands or houses to sell and give all the money to the apostles and they're still fine. So it's very socially diverse in terms of wealth or what we might now call something like class or something. 
We also know from Acts chapter 2 that the church is very geographically and ethnically diverse. The church is made up from people all over the known world. Because on the day of Pentecost, there are people there from Persia to Rome, from North Africa to Arabia, all over the world, at least all over Eurasia as they know it. In this chapter we just read, we met Barnabas for the first time, a Levite Cypriot. So he's from Cyprus, but he's also a Levitical from the tribe of Levi, a Jew. So there's a very diverse church. Yet, in all that diversity, there is breathtaking unity. Verse 32, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that his belongings were his own, but they had everything in common. Cypriots and Judeans, Persians and Arabs, Africans and Europeans, men and women, Greek and barbarians, one heart and soul. That's what this church is. It's an incredible model. Young and old, Republican and Democrat, black and white, Hispanic, Asian, all had everything in common. They didn't think anything was theirs. But they submitted themselves, they yielded to the one while retaining their diversity. The church is a salad, not a smoothie. You know that, right? You don't have to dissolve your individuality into the soup. You get to be you with all your lettuce-like crunchiness and your tomato-like softness and your heritage and your ethnicity and your sex are all part of who God's made you and all part of what he wants the church to be as they come together and the coming together of all of these things meeting in the middle brings greater glory to God as diversity and unity are expressed together. Now, tragically, that is not often seen in the church today. Many churches are segregated by style or by race or by wealth or by politics or by goodness knows what. Like that's the easy route to go down. So we will just do a church for people like this. We'll just do a church for people like that. But how did the Jerusalem church manage to avoid that? How did they meet in the middle? Well, they met in the middle because they made sacrifices. Verse 32, no one said that any of his stuff or her stuff was their own. That's so powerful. In Jerusalem's case, it was expressed financially. I mean, literally, I don't think of this as just being mine. I realise that this is part of something we have together and I don't have personal rights to it that you don't share. For many today, they might say, well, okay, that is expressed financially to us, but it might also be the thing that is harder to let go of for you. It might be things that are more cultural or, I don't know, political or... There's various things you have to let go of. Like this was true for me a few years ago. I moved church, I went to... I'm a pastor of a, a, it's a black majority church in South London and I love it. It's just a fantastic church family. And when I moved there, I was sort of part of the worship and I was enjoying the way that people were singing. And I was like, wow, it's really great to be able to go something that feels like a, a black gospel Pentecostal kind of church. But the fascinating thing was a year later, I met a friend of mine who's a, from a Caribbean background who he comes to the church and he said, oh yeah, the first time I came to Kings, I was like, oh, right. So this is how the white people worship. So he and I had gone to the same church and I thought, wow, this is like a really different experience for me. And he'd gone and gone, this is a really different experience for me. And he was like, what? You, you thought the church was the way I like to worship? And I was like, I th- what? You thought the church is the way I like? And it was both of us effectively had gone to the same experience and seen the other person's experiences. In fact, like, I've got a lower, uh, this isn't my own. This isn't something I hold on to. I've got to defer this for the greater thing. And it was only when you got to know each other, you realise, oh, we're both doing that. It's not like any one person is making all the compromise. The whole church, you did it today. There are things about this meeting today that you're in that you're like, that's not quite the way I'd choose it. That's the church. Because we, we say, this isn't my own. This is ours. And I therefore need to lay down some of my preferences every time I participate. So this church made sacrifices. That's how they remained united and diverse. They also had great focus on the thing that united them. Verse 33, with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Their source of unity in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus was greater than the things that might have divided them. And they are in your case too. They are in our unity together in the gospel is greater than, is more important than, is more powerful than the things that might otherwise divide us. And the, that, and the way you retain that unity is to keep focused on the one who, in whom you are united, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and his great grace over your life. And of course they did it because they were very generous to one another. 
there was no needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed. Verse 34. So how do you meet in the middle? Like I, th I think this is our, our mandate as the church of Jesus Christ. I think it's yours here in this state. And how do you do it? How do you meet in the middle? God's solution is a community where people don't think of things as just their own and they focus on the thing or the one in whom they are united and they have generosity to those who have less. It's called the Church of Jesus Christ and it's a community in which all of us, by God's grace, meet in the middle. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this remarkable church in Jerusalem and the way that it still has the power to challenge us because of the work of grace your Spirit had done amongst them. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this church, in this state, in the middle of this great country, I pray you would make us a church where theologically and experientially and culturally and personally, we would be united in our diversity, that we would be a place where theological truths are held together, where different kinds of people come together and where the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and His great grace is seen for the wondrous thing it is because we are not divided, but united and we meet in the middle. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.